2 Corinthians chapter 11 again. If you would go back there, please, with me. Going through the book of 2 Corinthians. Now, who's the author? No, who's the writer of the book? Paul is the writer of the book. You say, ah, that's no brainer. We know that. Well, remember that all scripture, including this, is given by inspiration of God. And that word inspiration literally means that the Bible is God-breathed. This book and this particular chapter that we're looking at is God-breathed inspired. God's the author of it. In fact, God hand-picked spirit-filled men to write the Bible. While the Bible is a supernatural, it's a miraculous book, it's unlike any other book, because even though human men were chosen to write it, the Holy Spirit of God is the one that superintended and over, he oversaw the entire writing of the Bible. And so that makes the Bible something unlike any other book in the world. Perhaps that's probably why it's always been the number one seller, so to speak. No more evident of the human writership of any book than here in this 11th chapter. If you read Paul's writings, you know it's Paul. This chapter is full of Paul's personality. It's full of sarcasm. It's full of irony. It's full of satire. It's like Paul takes the gloves off, so to speak, doesn't pull any punches, and he just tells it like it is in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. He is fierce in defending God's work because if he doesn't defend God's work that God did there in the church at Corinth, then his service there would be in vain. The church has been invaded. It's been invaded by, you know what the word apostle means? It literally means sent ones. The church has been invaded by false apostles. Uh, people that took it upon themselves to send themselves or their little uh, sectarian group sent them from the church in Jerusalem to invade this Corinthian church with really false teaching. I already told you that they were uh, foisting Jewish legalism in the church there in Corinth, trying to put these new Gentile believers under the law of Moses. And so that's what's happening here. Paul defends himself in this chapter because if, if you can delegitimize his apostleship, then you also delegitimize the church in Corinth. So they attack Paul. They say that he's not a real apostle. And uh, that attack, of course, is on the Lord's work as well. And so what Paul does is he punches back really hard. He punches back in, in a way that is kind of amazing, really. And he paints these, they like to call themselves super apostles. He, he uh, in um, satire, he says in chapter 11 and verse 5, for I suppose that I was not a whit behind the chiefest, or you super apostles, is what he said. He paints the, these opponents in two significant ways. And I, I find it uh, uh, a little humorous as I think about it. But he, first of all, paints them as spiritual chameleons. You know what a chameleon is? We've had seven children, and believe me, our family has all has had all kinds of sorts of pets. We've had hamsters. Before we came to Brooklyn and uh, and met real rats, we had a pet white rat. 
we don't like rats anymore. <laughs> but we've had hamsters, we've had a cat, we've had a dog, we've had fish. We even had a pair of lovebirds one time. Believe me, we've had just about all the pets that you can think of. But one of our boys wanted a chameleon. So we got him a chameleon. A chameleon is a little lizard. They're normally green, but they change their skin changes colors according to the environment that they're in. If their environment is uh, more uh, greenish brown, they turn that color. If their environment is totally brown, they turn that color. Their skin turns the color of their surroundings so that they can be camouflaged. Chameleons, camouflage. Sad thing is, he got out of his uh, cage and I think we found him months later. He was all dried up under the bunk bed, something like that. What Paul is saying here about these super apostles is that they really are just chameleons. They're just spiritual chameleons. In fact, look at what he says in verse 13. Such are false apostles. They're not super apostles. They're false apostles. They're deceitful workers transforming themselves, masquerading themselves as the apostles of Messiah. Ah. Satan himself does the same thing. He pretends to be something he isn't. He's a chameleon. Verse 15. So if Satan does it, it's no great thing if his, his servants transform themselves to look like servants of the Messiah when in fact they're servants of Satan. That's what he's saying. Spiritual chameleons. We'll talk about that a little bit further after we pause a moment in prayer. Heavenly Father, we're just grateful to be able to have the Bible. It's just such a, a blessing to have the light of the word of God shine upon our minds, our hearts. Like the psalmist says, the entrance of thy word giveth light. He giveth understanding to the simple. And Lord, we need your light this morning. We pray for the anointing of the Holy Spirit both upon the hearts of the hearers as well as the anointing of your messengers, Lord. We ask that you would do this so that Christ would be glorified. We pray that you would honor his name and that in all things we give him the preeminence. And we thank you that you are able to meet the spiritual needs of every single individual and we pray to that end today in jesus name amen so we're dealing with these super apostles these spiritual chameleons who deceptively they change their message and even their behavior in order to manipulate people and the situation so that they can gain for themselves a personal advantage, whatever it is they desire. So they present themselves as spiritual leaders, but they're actually imposters. They're not the real thing. And Paul deals with this head on as he begins in chapter 11. He says, would to God, he's speaking to the church, that you could bear with me a little in my foolishness. These ones that you're listening to, that you're putting up with, are fools. I wish you would put up with a little of my foolishness and bear with me. Here's why. Verse 2. For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a pure, chaste, virgin to Christ, but I fear, lest by any means, that just as the serpent beguiled Eve in that garden, because of his subtlety, his cleverness, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity of the sincerity that is in Christ. 
the first thing I want you to see that uh, Paul says that he has regarding these spiritual chameleons that he is addressing and dealing with that problem is that he feels jealousy. And it is the jealousy of a parent. You know, parents have a right to be jealous of their children in the sense that they're jealous to protect their children. It's the jealousy of parental protection that he's talking about here. While true love will never envy, true love has a right to be jealous over the person that is loved. Here is a father's jealousy over his children, over his child. He's seeking to protect his spiritual children from anything that will harm them spiritually. You know what we have pictured here in that second verse? The father of the bride. That's the picture. We have a loving father who has an, a daughter that's engaged or betrothed to be married. And he feels that it's his privilege as the dad. It's his duty to keep his daughter pure so that he can present her to her future husband with joy. The Apostle Paul is viewing himself in this second verse as the father of the bride, and the bride being the Corinthian church, who he says is engaged to become the wife of Messiah. You know, the Bible says, that when the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is raptured, that we will be taken up for to ever be with the Lord. And uh, following that, we will be involved in what is called the wedding supper of the Lamb, in which we will go from being the bride of Christ, which is what the church is pictured now, to becoming the wife of the Messiah. It's a wonderful picture, and that's what Paul is talking about here. And he's talking about the peril, the, 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 the peril of unfaithfulness to the fiancé uh, because there is another person that is very clever doing everything possible to deceive this, this young woman and to steal her mind, to steal her heart by mind games that he would play, to steal the simplicity or the sincerity, the single-minded devotion that she is to have for the one that she is betrothed to or engaged to, which in this case is the church's betrothal to Jesus. By the way, we're in the betrothal period right now until Jesus raptures us. And so as a betrothed bride of Jesus the Messiah, it's our responsibility to keep ourselves chaste, to keep ourselves pure, to keep ourselves undefiled, to not be involved in spiritual immorality, you might say, or spiritual unfaithfulness to our bridegroom, the Lord Jesus, the Messiah. But that's the peril that uh, the church is facing, that Paul is concerned about here, that he's jealous over them in that way, that they would be defiled, that they would destroy this betrothal in a uh, relationship that they have with Jesus. And now that's the mark of a real spiritual leader that he is concerned about the people's relationship to Jesus, that it's kept right, it's kept pure. He's jealous. And in the passage here, there are a couple of perpetrators of this evil that Paul is trying to protect the church from. There's a couple of perps. <laughs> One of them is very clearly in verse 3, Satan himself. See that? Always have to be aware of the fact that we are dealing not merely with flesh and blood. 
But as believers, we're engaged in an unseen realm. We talked about this last Sunday in the PM Bible study. We're engaged in spiritual warring in what is called the unseen realm. Spiritual wickedness in the heavenlies, in the invisible realm of the heavenlies. And the chief opponent or adversary is none other than this one who is called here the serpent. He's the serpent. We are told in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12 that we need to stand against the wiles or the craftiness or the cleverness, the clever methods or devices that Satan uses to tempt and to uh, try to take us away from our relationship with Jesus. But there's a second perp in this chapter that Paul's concerned about, and that's the spiritual chameleons who are like their master, Satan. In verse 4, For if he that cometh preaches another Jesus, whom we haven't preached, you receive another spirit which we have not received or another gospel which we have not accepted, you might as well bear with them. So there is the unseen realm where we have an adversary and he has a lot of helpers, a lot of imps, a lot of evil spirits that are invisible to us, but nonetheless just as real. But there is also the earthly realm in verse 4. These are the guys that he talks about in verse 13 that are false apostles, deceitful workers that transform themselves into the, the sent ones of Jesus, of the Messiah. He says, these in the earthly realm, what they're bringing to you is, verse 4, an alternative Jesus. But you know what an alternative Jesus is? The Jesus that the Bible presents is a suffering, is a suffering Jesus, is one that suffers crucifixion. That doesn't sit well with these guys. They were presenting an alternative Jesus that, uh, that didn't approve of suffering. A different spirit other than the Holy Spirit. You know, the the true spirit of God, he suffers too. He groans. He groans, and he groans in us with groanings that cannot be physically uttered. So there's a suffering Savior. There's a suffering Holy Spirit. They don't like that, that pain and that suffering. That, they don't want that to be connected with the church and with Christianity. They come with a different gospel, verse 4 says. And we know that the gospel centers in a crucified Savior. A crucified, yes, and risen Savior. But these guys are false apostles. They are deceitful workers, verse 13 says. They're like chameleons that change their color to match their surroundings so that they can manipulate people. They are false teachers, listen to me, that are energized by Satan himself. By the way, he's called the serpent in verse 3 and is referred to as the serpent that beguiled Eve. Now, when I think of Genesis 3 and that temptation, that original temptation, I don't think of a snake. Did you know that that Hebrew word serpent in Genesis 3 actually means shining one? Look at verse 14. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. He didn't, he wasn't an ugly snake when he appeared to Eve. He was a beautiful angel of light. He was a, a shining one that would, uh, that would wow and would uh, just capture one's attention. He's an angel of light. And these men, he says, are just like him. They are outwardly morphing from evil, false apostles 
to look like good God sent apostles. They transform themselves. See that word in verse 13, as well as in uh, 14 and 15, same word. It means they disguise themselves. They put on a mask. They masquerade themselves as someone would at a party that uh, they wouldn't want you to know who they really are. So they put on an outward mask in order to allure you away from the truth and to get what they want. So this is why Paul is jealous because of these spiritual chameleons that he has to warn and protect the church from. And then he talks about not only his jealousy, but uh, he talks about his generosity in comparison to these others. In verse 7, have I committed an offense in lowering myself that you might be lifted up? Because I preached to you the gospel of God freely. I didn't put a price tag on it. In fact, I robbed other churches taking wages of them. In other words, I expected to be supported financially by other churches that really couldn't afford it. But I robbed them so that I could work among you, so I could serve you. And I was present with you, verse 9, when I was present with you, and when I was in need, when I had real need, I was chargeable to no man. That which was lacking in me, it didn't, uh, you didn't make it up. You didn't give me to my need. Instead, I got it from the churches of Macedonia. Remember the church at Philippi? In fact, the, the letter that appears in our New Testament is, is uh, essentially a thank you note that Paul is sending to the church at uh, Philippi for meeting his financial needs. And so this is what he's saying. I You didn't give to me. I, I didn't want to burden you, verse 9. I didn't want to be burdensome to you. So I didn't even tell you what my need was. And other people... They, uh, they stepped up and uh, cared for me at that point. Verse 10, as the truth of Messiah is in me, no man shall stop me of this boasting in the regions of Achaia, which is today a part of the country of Greece. Why? Why did I do this? Why did I not take money from you? Because I love you not. They were saying, Oh, the, uh, the, these, these false apostles were saying, you know why he didn't take support from you? It's because he doesn't care about you. He doesn't love you. And so he's addressing that in verse 11. It's not true. God knows. Verse 12, but what I do, that I will do, that I may cut off occasion from them which desire occasion, that wherein they glory, they may be found even as we. Okay. So his jealousy was all about parental protection, like a parent protecting his child, his daughter. But this section on generosity is all about parental provision. And basically what he's saying, as a parent sacrifice for his children, so uh, a parent sometimes goes without, so the children's needs are met. So he's saying... I sacrifice to be able to be a blessing to you, my spiritual children, to be a blessing to the church at Corinth. I deliberately refused a salary from you to avoid any accusation by the false apostles or to be owned by you so that I would not have to do what you said I have to do. And for refusing financial help from the Corinthian church, these false teachers were accusing Paul of not loving the church, not loving them. And so he's dealing with these spiritual chameleons that have stirred up a lot of trouble in this local church in the city of Corinth. There's a second thing, the rest of the chapter, really, I say, uh, verse 16 to 33 he addresses, uh, he paints these false apostles in, a, in, a, in another way. 
not spiritual chameleons, but in verses 16 to 33, he paints them as spiritual morons. I want you to note, he says in verse 16, I say again, let no man think me a fool. If otherwise, yet as a fool, receive me, that I boast myself a little, that that which I speak, I speak it not after the Lord, but as it were foolishly, in this confidence of boasting. Verse 18, seeing that many glory after the flesh, I will glory also. Verse 19, for you suffer fools gladly, seeing you yourself are wise. Again, verse 21, I speak foolishly. Remember how he started this 11th chapter where he said, would to God that you would bear with me a little in my foolishness and my folly. So he's using that same term, different at the same root word, uh, which means foolishness or fool. It's similar, not the same word, but similar to the word that he used and the way he spoke to the Corinthians in his first letter to them. Listen to this. This is from 1 Corinthians chapter 1. He says, because the the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men, for you see your calling, brethren, How that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. He's talking to them about foolishness. And interestingly, the words in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 that appear over and over again, foolishness, a different word, but really the same meaning that he's using in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. But the word in 1 Corinthians 1 is the the word that we get our English word moron from. And so now he's dealing with them as spiritual morons. Now understand this. A moron is not someone that is necessarily intellectually deficient. That's a psychological, modern psychological use of the word. But the word in the Bible, moron, speaks of people that lack spiritual understanding, people that are spiritually senseless, people that are illogical and that are thoughtless as far as spiritual truth is concerned. So what he's saying is perhaps these super apostles, these false apostles, are uh, intellectually bright or brilliant, but in spiritual understanding, they're morons. <laughs> That's what he's saying. In fact, again, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 18, he says, the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. It's moronic, is basically what he says. Verse 21, for after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. And so in chapter 2 of 1 Corinthians, when he makes his first trip there, he says, my speech and my preaching was not with the enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. And he says, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are moronic to him. They're foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because these truths are spiritually discerned. So that's what I mean by Paul calling them not only spiritual chameleons, but spiritual morons. They did not have the capacity to understand spiritual truth because they didn't have the mind of Christ. They weren't born again people. They were natural men that didn't understand the things of the the truth of the spirit of God. And so the apostle, what he does in the remaining part of chapter 11 is he he stoops to their level. (laughs) He says, okay, you want to be spiritual morons? Okay, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to feed you some spiritual uh, moronish 
things here. I'm going to come down to your level. And he compares himself to them. Remember what he said in chapter 10? He, he says that uh, one of the things that these false apostles were doing wrong is that they were comparing themselves one to another. But in chapter 11, that's what he does because he's trying to prove his point. This is how foolish you guys are. And so he compares himself. He comes down to their level and uh, he, he begins to boast. That's what the word glory means that in our English version. He begins to boast. Now, he does it reluctantly. And I would call 16 to 33 the boasting of reluctance. He doesn't really want to boast. He's just showing them how spiritually moronish they are, how empty of spiritual understanding they are, and what spiritual truth really is about. So he's like, you're forcing me to have to do this, to have to boast this way. But you know what he does? Listen, he turns the whole thing upside down. And unlike them, boasting of his strength, his power, you know what he focuses on and boasts about? His weakness. His inability. That's what he does. What really it is to be wise. It's not what they thought it was. What really is strength is not what they were saying it is. And so in verses 16 to 27, he goes through a long list of the difficulties that he faced. Uh, we can look at them quickly. I'm not going to speak to all of them. But uh, he, he says in verse uh, 23, in labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, stripes, that is uh, whippings, lashings. More uh, in, in prisons, more frequent in death or death situations, more oft of the Jews. Verse 24, five times received I 40 stripes, save one. And what he means by that, uh, the beatings that he suffered in the synagogues that he preached the gospel in and uh, the Jewish law only allowed 40 lashes, no more than that. And they would only uh, give 39 so that they wouldn't exceed the legal limit. And he said, that happened to me five times, verse 24. Thrice, three times, I was beaten with rods. That is a Roman punishment that was administered to Paul in the city of Philippi, uh, for one. He says uh, in verse 25, once I was stoned. That happened in Acts 14 in the city of Lystra. And then he says, uh, in uh, perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness and watchings often, in hunger and thirst and fastings, often in cold and nakedness. What a list. By the way, he talks about uh, perils in the sea. Uh, remember Acts 27 records him being shipwrecked. But that was after he wrote this. So that's not even counted here in uh, his uh, story, his litany of the, of the weakness, the, the difficulty. He suffered hardship. He suffered hardship. And this hardship that he's referring to in verses 16 to 27 is all external. It's things that he suffered in his body. It's things that he suffered, uh, and they were, they were not occasional. They were continual. But then in verses 28 and 29, he talks about anxiety that he suffered inside, not outside, inside. And he says this, beside those things that are without the external suffering, difficulty, that which cometh upon me daily, inwardly, the care of all the churches. He says, who is weak? And I'm not weak. Who is offended and I burn not? He, he's, he's talking about the, the inner stress in, verses, uh, in verse 28 particularly. It was, a, it was a constant thing that he suffered. It wasn't occasional. So he's weak because of the difficulties. 
that were external and occasional, but he also is weak because of the anxiety that is internal and that is continual. And his anxiety is over his people. His anxiety is over the churches that God used him to, uh, to start. And so here's a man that calls himself weak. In fact, in verse 30, he says, if I'm going to boast, if I am going to stoop to your level and boast, I will boast of the things which concern my infirmities, he says. I'm going to boast not about how strong I am like you guys, but I'm going to boast about how weak I am. That's what I'm going to boast. Here is true spirituality. In light of difficulty and anxiety, here is true spirituality. And at the center and heart of all that Paul says is that 30th verse. I think that's the key to the whole chapter. And really, it really, it embraces not only the difficulties and anxieties that he lists here, but it really is, again, the theme for the whole book of 2 Corinthians, where we boast in our weakness because strength, spiritual strength, comes through human weakness. He talks about his difficulties and his anxieties so that he exposes his utter personal weakness that the absence of God in the picture, then he has nothing. He's, he's done for. There's no hope. And it's the opposite of what these false apostles are boasting about their own personal superiority. But he says, wait a minute. In myself, I'm nothing. I have absolutely no strength. I'm totally weak. It's what Paul meant when he said in 1 Corinthians 15, 10, I am what I am by the grace of God, by the strengthening, strengthening of God in me. Have you ever heard of the Medal of Honor? Have you ever seen it? You ever seen the president pin this medal on, uh, on someone? He goes behind them and puts it around their neck. That's the Medal of Honor. The Medal of Honor is the United States Armed, for, Armed Forces highest military decoration. It's awarded to recognized American soldiers, sailors, Marines, airmen, guardians, coast guardmen who have distinguished themselves by specific acts of valor or bravery. The medal is normally awarded by the President of the United States, who is, of course, the Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces, and it is presented to the recipient in the name of the United States Congress. Did you know that Rome, in Paul's day, had a Medal of Honor? Ancient Roman military might and bravery was one of the highest virtues in the world in that time. And uh, in particular, a near equivalent to this Medal of Honor was a medal that the Roman government awarded to their soldiers that distinguished themselves in battle. Specifically, it was called the Corona Moralis the Corona Moralis, which literally means in Latin, the crown of the wall. And the crown was actually put on the head of the recipient and it looked like a city wall. Archaeologists in Corinth have found a marble statue of Lady Luck that is dated to somewhere around Paul's time and she is wearing the Corona the Corona Morales. This Corona Morales was awarded for specific military achievement by the Roman government. Back in ancient times, when they laid siege to a city, the cities had huge walls encircling them. 
And what would happen in ancient warfare is that the invading army would surround the walls of the city that they're invading. And they would use huge battering rams to break down the gates in the city wall. But that didn't always work. And if you couldn't batter the gates open in a city to invade it, then sometimes you just had to wait it out. And the, the legions would camp around the walls of the city sometime for months. They would camp around the walls of the city waiting for the food and water supply to run out. But at other times, they would also attempt to um, break into a city by making long ladders that they would put up against the walls of the city for soldiers, special soldiers, to climb up and enter into the city. But it was a very dangerous method. As you can imagine, ladders against walls could be pushed over when men are on them, or they could be shot uh, by arrows as they're coming up, or sometimes they, they poured hot boiling water or tar on the men that were trying to climb up the ladders. And so it was a very dangerous maneuver. And the first one that uh, breached the wall over the ladder usually ended up being killed. And so this award, the Corona Morales, was for the first one that breached the wall over the top on the ladder. And often the reward was given to them uh, posthumously. In other words, they were dead when they were awarded it. But if they happened to survive, they would have to claim the crown by returning to Rome and then swearing before the gods of Rome and by oath that they were telling the truth. I think that's probably the only explanation that we have here to understand what Paul is saying in verses 31 to 33 as he ends the chapter. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is blessed forever, knoweth I lie not. He's swearing to the truth. In Damascus, the governor under Aratus, the king, kept the city of the Damascenes with a garrison desirous to apprehend me and through a window in a basket, I was let down by the wall and escaped his hands. Paul has just listed an achievement that he boasted in. And it was the absolute opposite of what Romans or anyone would boast in or celebrate. In verses 32 and 33, Paul is saying, and I think this is the, the great point of the whole passage, that he's boasting about all the wrong things. <laughs> and, in, and instead of breaching the city wall for victory, he was let down over the city wall and he ran away the things that the Romans would be ashamed to ever mention, let alone celebrate. This is the climax, really, of Paul's list, verses 32 and 33, of his boasting. And he's claiming that when his life was threatened, he went over the wall and ran away. That's what he's saying. So his claim is really an upside-down Corona Morales. And that's what verse 30 is all about. If I must deeds glory, I will glory or I will boast of the things which concern my infirmities, my weakness. I'm weak. This is proof of it. This is the focus of the whole chapter. You force me to boast? Okay, I'm going to boast and I'm going to show you how weak I am that the crown that really matters to me is not the Corona Morales, but the Corona Christi, the crown of Messiah. That's what matters to me. My master was taken away from the city in disgrace to die outside the city walls. 
And I, as the apostle of Christ, was let down over the city wall and I ran away. It's upside down living. And we as believers must learn to turn the world's values upside down. As believers, we must learn to live an upside down life. Because an upside down life, biblically, is the right way up life as a true servant follower of Jesus. So what do we boast in? What do we glory in? Paul will say in another passage in Galatians, God forbid that I should glory except in the cross, the crucifixion, the suffering Messiah, the suffering Jesus, because that is the apex, that is the climax of all that God came to do to redeem mankind, to win back the human family to himself that uh, walked away from him, that betrayed him in that garden that God has paid the ultimate price, not sparing his own son, but delivering him up for us all. And if that crucifixion means anything, then if you add any human work to it, you frustrate the grace of God, as he says in Galatians 2 and verse 21. It's all of God. It's all of grace. It's all his work. It's his suffering death that wins salvation for any human being. And that's what we need to boast in, a crucified Christ. And to boast in a crucified Christ, you have to recognize that you yourself have been co-crucified with him. I have been crucified with Christ. So nevertheless, though I'm alive physically, the life that I live in this physical body, I'm crucified. So it's not my life. That's dead. And the life that I live is the life of the living, resurrected Christ who lives in me so that he can live through me. That's the Christian life, folks. It's the upside down way of living, which is really the right way up way of living.